Hello, everyone. Good evening. I hope you all had a great Sunday and your weekend went well and you're just about ready to get back into work. I know many of you are not excited to go back to work, but you have to do it, right? You have bills to pay, mouths to feed. So I hope your weekend is going good. If you're not okay, then we're going to pray that, you know, God will give you some strength and send some help and send some good energy. And this is good energy. The green lane is good energy. This evening's topic will be realities of racism. It's not just black and white. The realities of racism, it's not just black and white. Now, in thinking through this topic, I know that it's a sticking point for many persons. And it's a serious topic. It's a broad topic. So this discussion is by no means exhaustive. It's just to go through and to talk about it and to hear your points of view and to share some facts about this whole thing about racism. Some of us know what it is, including myself and my wife. Um, many people and some persons don't, depending on where you are, right? But I'm sure everyone has, has experienced some kind of ism at some point in time. So before I jump into it, this topic may be a trigger for some persons. If you're viewing, discretion is advised, okay? If you have a strong bias, this discussion may not be for you. Objectivity is crucial. So please be respectful and think broadly and openly. Open-mindedness is important. Again, if you're triggered by discussions on race or slavery, you may, you may want to tune out, okay? So topic again, realities of racism. It's not just black and white. My name is Derville Lowe, your host. Now, this is episode two. The first episode, um, it did not go off without its own challenges. I had technical challenges. And then you may not have seen it posted after the live was finished because there were some copyright issues. Now, it, I, I thought it was... Okay, because I was sharing the screen, um, but the content that I shared was not owned by me. And although I made the disclaimer, that wasn't enough. So I could not share those videos on LinkedIn or Facebook because of those copyright issues. So you will not be able to view episode one. No problem. Going forward, if the content isn't owned by me or someone I get written permission from, it will not be shared. Lesson learned. And um, someone said to me, um, those kind of mistakes, learning means growth, right? And I'm always open to learn. So you will not be seeing episode one posted anywhere because of that, okay? Just so you know, we're going to get into it. Again, my name is Derville, your host. Um, just gonna introduce myself again. I'm originally from Jamaica and moved to Canada in 2017. I am an author uh, I own a publishing company. I co-own a kid's brand with my wife. We do children's books. Um, some of you know that. So, you know, I'm working on different projects and doing different things as God allows me to have skill and time. I, I'm trying all kinds of things. So this, the idea for this show came to me in 2020 to do a podcast, but I wasn't sure what to do. So I shelved it, I didn't chase it. Um, when this year started, I thought, why not try it? Why not do it now? But instead of a podcast, do a live stream and have people interact live. So I hope you will join. Please share the live on your network so people can know about it. I will be sharing, well, I have shared it 
um, on all my social media platforms. So please share it, please join. Share your insights as well. Join the chat. I want to hear from you. If you're on LinkedIn, once you type and share, it will show up in my restream feed. Maybe, I'm not sure what happened the last time, but the Facebook comments were not showing up in my restream feed. But if not, um, Tash is here and she'll help me to see those comments. But please engage, please join the conversation and make it a wonderful, wonderful experience for everyone. The realities of racism, it's not just black and white. So I spent some time doing some research to give this discussion a broad context. I, want, I don't want it to be limited to one geographical area or to one group of persons. So I got some information from the Encyclopedia Britannica, pbs.org and some other sources and pulled from those sources and I have it all here. So, um, let me jump into it, sorry about that. So we're talking about racism and racism is intrinsically linked to slavery. It is rooted in slavery. So I, 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 the context I'm going to give is from a slavery background, but it's global, right? So by definition, slavery is a condition in which one human being is supposedly owned by another, right? A slave was considered or is considered to be property, right? Quote unquote property and deprived of his or her rights, okay? So, so persons who enslaved others considered themselves in a, in a better position. They had a superiority complex and they enslaved persons, took away their rights and considered them property. So human beings who were slaves were owned, quote unquote, by other persons. Racism, by definition, Prejudice, discrimination, antagonism by an individual or community or institution against a person or people on the basis of their membership in a particular racial or ethnic group. Typically, um, persons who uh, suffer racism are uh, marginalized or a minority. Good? So you can see by definition where racism would be rooted in slavery. Some persons may have it the other way around, which is fine. The discussion is open. But for this discussion, we're going, we're going to go from the angle that racism is rooted in slavery. So some context, some background. I'm going to give that to you right now. The slave trade, the, 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 as we know it, is the capturing, selling, buying of um, persons who were considered property, right? Um, it existed throughout the world since ancient times. And when we talk about slavery in the modern context, we often talk about slavery from the transatlantic perspective. We usually don't pull in other um, experiences, right? But it has existed throughout the world since ancient times. Training in slaves has been equally universal. Enslaved persons were taken from Slavs, Iranians, from antiquity in the to the 19th century. Good. All kinds of persons were involved in slave. Germanic, Celtic, and Roman peoples during the Viking era. I mean, medieval times, a long time ago, right? Elaborate trade networks developed. For example, in the 9th and 10th centuries, Vikings might sell East Slavic slaves to Arab and Jewish traders who would take them to Verdun and Leon, whence they might be sold throughout Spain and North Africa. It was going on a long time ago. No, China, slavery is known to have existed as early as the 18th to the 12th century BCE. It has been studied thoroughly in ancient Han China, 206 BCE to 25 CE, 
where perhaps 5% of the population was enslaved. Slavery continued to be a feature of Chinese society down to the 20th century. Good. Korea. And I had opportunity to live in South Korea for three years. And I can tell you that the, 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 the racism there isn't evident. Some of the kindest people I met are um, in Korea, right? But in Korea, they had a large slave population, ranging from a third to half of the entire population for most of the millennium between the Shinla period and the mid 18th century. Most of the slaves in Korea were indigenous. So Koreans enslaved Koreans, right? Then we move to India. Um, slavery existed in India as well. And in 1841, there were an estimated 9 million slaves in India, many of whom were agrestic or pradial. Um, that is slaves who were attached to the land they worked on, but could be moved around if the owners um, thought it um, was needed. Societies in the Philippines, Nepal, Malaysia, Indonesia, Japan are known to have had slavery from ancient until fairly recent times. The same was true among the various peoples inhabiting the regions of Central Asia, right? Such as the Mongols, Kamiks, and Kazakhs. So Asia also had slavery going on. And even today, there is still a... a, a what, 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 uh, Residual. Um, residual effects of um, slavery um, between Japan and Korea because the Japanese um, enslaved especially had some of the Korean women as sex slaves, right? So they had their share of slavery as well. In England, um, about 10% of the population entered the Doomsday Book in 1086, the year 1086, where slaves, um, with uh, the proportion reaching about 20% in some places. Slaves are also prominent in Scandinavia during the Viking era, as I mentioned before, and slaves were used at home and for sale in the international slave markets. Continental Europe, France, Germany, Poland, Lithuania, Russia, all knew slavery as well. Russia was essentially founded by a, as a byproduct of slave raiding by the Vikings, passing from Scandinavia to Byzantium in the ninth century. Slavery remained a major institution there until the early 1720s when the state converted household slaves into house slaves in order to put them on the tax rolls. So they, they changed it a bit so they could work, get wages and pay taxes. In the Middle East, there was also slavery. As, as far back as history is recorded, it was treated as a prominent institution in the Babylonian code of Hammurabi of uh, about 1750 BC. So we're going back far in history, right? Slaves were present in ancient Egypt. And that is chronicled in, in Exodus in the Bible, actually, if you read it. And they were known to have murdered slaves to accompany their deceased owners, right? That was a part of their tradition. So right here, let's pay attention. Africans were slavers. Africans owned slaves. And we're going to talk more about that as well. Good. We're going to talk more about that. Um, moving on. Slavery was also practiced in the Middle East. Um, of Egyptians, Babylonians, etc. Slaves were owned in all Isla Islamic societies, both sedentary and nomadic, ranging from Arabia in the center to North Africa in the west and to what is now Pakistan and Indonesia in the east. Some Islamic states, such as the Ottoman Empire, the Crimean Khanate, and Sokoto Caliphate, must be termed or are usually termed slave societies because slaves were there were very important in their societies slaves have been owned in black africa throughout recorded history 
I want to pause there because we often speak of slavery in terms of Europeans enslaving Africans. However, if we should go back before the transatlantic slave trade, right, we would see where Africans sold Africans into slavery. Good. In many areas, there were large scale slave societies, while in others, there were slave owning societies. Slavery was practiced everywhere even before the rise of Islam and black slaves exported from Africa were widely traded throughout the Islamic world. Approximately 18 million Africans were delivered into the Islamic trans-Saharan and Indian Ocean trade, um, slave trade between 650, uh, the year 650 and 1905. In the second half of the 15th century, Europeans began to trade along the west coast of Africa, which takes us to the transatlantic slave trade. Now, the transatlantic slave trade, which is what we usually talk about when we hear about slavery, Europeans taking Africans from Africa, bringing them to uh, the Caribbean, South America, like Brazil, the United States. That's what we usually hear about. Good. Women, children, men were taken in the belly of boats in, in, in less than humane conditions. Sometimes the boats were so built that the slaves couldn't even stand and they were chained, leg and arms chained like cattle and thrown into the ships and brought across the Caribbean, right? Where they were sold at auction and taken throughout the new world. Good? Now, we have to understand that slavery, the Europeans were practicing slavery and they were doing all these things before they showed up in Africa. Good? It's very important that we understand that. It, it wasn't that they pinpointed Africans. They were doing it to each other first. And we, don't, we often don't talk about that bit, of course. In most modern society, um, we know about the Holocaust where Nazi Germany had um, systematically um, pers persecuted Jews. Now, the state-sponsored killing of about 6 million Jewish women um, men and children by Nazi Germany, of course, led by um, Adolf Hitler. The Germans call it the final solution to the Jewish question. As far as they were concerned, Jews were subhuman. So Germans were parahuman, it seemed, and Jews were subhuman. And we know about that as well, the Holocaust, which many Jews prefer to call the Shoah. Right, because um, they prefer to use that term. Um, Adolf Hitler is quoted as saying, quote, um, the rationale for anti-Semitism must lead to systematic legal opposition. Its final objective must unswervingly be the removal of the Jews altogether, unquote. So, that was the context, that was the thought process that the Germans had towards the Jews and not just enslaved them, but slaughtered them. Good? And that is another important one. And going back to what happened to, with Africans, and I'm going to let in um, persons who want to join the conversation shortly, but I want to just give you the full context of what I would like to discuss. Good? In 17th and 18th centuries, enslaved African persons were traded in the Caribbean for molasses, which was made into um, rum in the African colonies and traded back to Africa for more slaves. Now, African tribes were involved in this trade. Very important. And I don't want us to miss this point. So I'm going to just point something out here. African slaves were initially captured in intertribal warfare, but later directly for sale in what became a lucrative uh, slave trade. They were sold into the Americas for workforce 
and other enterprises. And of course, they went through other atrocities um, during that time, right? As they came across the Middle Passage, a lot of atrocities happened. And I have some information on that too that I pulled off just to give you more context into that as well. So, um, where are we? Here. Over 12.5 million African slaves were traded during that time, about that, between 1526 and 1866, right? And they were brought to the Americas to, to, to work, to work the land, to plant sugar, rice, cotton, tobacco, etc. Build train lines, build buildings to serve the Europeans under bondage, right? Throughout the Caribbean. Historians estimate that between 15 and 25% of the enslaved Africans bound for the Americas died aboard slave ships. Atrocities and sexual abuse of the enslaved um, slaves was widespread. Although their monetary value as slaves perhaps were mitigated, um, their, their, their monetary value mitigated their treatment. So they tried to keep them alive because there was a value, a monetary value on them. Ship captains could not ignore the health of their human cargo, human cargo. This is what they called human beings that they pulled out of Africa because they were paid only for enslaved persons delivered alive. Now there are two infamous incidents that happened on the slave ship Zong, which is a popular ship in 1781, um, Africans and crew members were dying of a disease. And the captain of the ship, um, Luke Collingwood, hoping to stop the disease, decided to throw over 130 slaves overboard. Mass murder, right? So they were tied to heavy objects, maybe cannonballs or whatever it was, and thrown overboard. Yes, but I'm coming to something else related to this later on, right? He then filed, Captain Collingwood, after throwing people, human beings, human cargo, African slaves overboard, filed an insurance claim on the value of the murdered persons, right? And that was one such incident, infamous. Another one was aboard the Amistad, this was the opposite. A slave in 1839, a slave named Joseph Sunk led a mutiny um, with the slaves, took over the ship, killing the captain and two members of the crew. And there's a movie on that, the Amistad as well. Um, coming down, Great Britain eventually outlawed slavery throughout its empire in 1833. But as we know, it didn't end there. It was only on paper and rebranded as colonialism. Good. And that's context that I wanted to share before we continue in the discussion. So I will take some of the comments I was getting. I don't think I'm getting anything on LinkedIn. We are talking about LinkedIn, but on Facebook. Uh, Miguel is saying, oh. right? Sorry about that. So Tash is helping me out here. He's not appearing again. I'm going to have to figure out that. Um, all right, not getting anything on the feed in here. <clears throat> Miguel. Miguel, Tash says, interesting. Slavery was the economic backbone of Africa. Hitler was reacting to the rejection received from the parents of a Jewish girl after he had become interested in her. Now, and he's encouraging us to watch the Amistad. It's a good movie to watch. And if you are subscribed to Netflix, there are quite a few movies on Netflix that are based on true stories of how many of these things unfolded. So if you have that subscription, you can check that out as well. Invite your friends to join. I would like to hear your feedback 
on this particular subject. All right, so there, with this whole backdrop, we can now discuss slavery on a broader scale. I don't like to discuss slavery as if it's only between the 1500s and 1800s. There is a lot more to the plot than that. The transatlantic slave trade, of course, is most recent. And again, what I'm talking about here, the information I have, isn't exhaustive. It's just to give context. It's a broad subject. There's a lot to read. I just pulled from all the things that I was reading to give some context on the global scale of slavery and how racism came out of that. Racism came out of that because one group of persons saw themselves superior to another group of persons. And they found a way, both psychologically and by force, to put people under bondage. Good? And I don't want the thought to escape us that Africans enslaved Africans and Africans enslaved other people. Good? We often speak of slavery as if Africans are the only victims. In the modern world, we speak of marginalized communities as if Africans or descendants of Africans are the only marginalized group. It's not so, right? Right here in Canada, um, the indigenous people, often when I look at it from my perspective, immigrants like myself have more access to certain services than even the indigenous people themselves. It's their land, their home. Yes? And, and they are still trying to come to terms with losing their home to the Europeans, specifically the British and the French. Right? Many of the persons who are alive today were put in residential schools and left half dead. And recent, in recent times, they found bodies of persons who were murdered and secretly buried right here in Canada, indigenous persons. So it, it's a big, broad subject. Fortunately, the indigenous people of uh, the United States and Canada are fortunate. The indigenous people of Jamaica weren't so fortunate. They were annihilated. So from the history of slavery and conquest and trying to be superior one group over another came the scourge of racism that we're still grappling with today. We're still grappling with that today. Let's talk about, are there any other comments coming in? No. All right. As you think about what to say, um, I'm going to continue to share some information and then have that discussion. And you can chime in at any time from wherever you're watching from, and we can involve you in the conversation. Now, I found some stuff which disturbed me, but I can handle it. Hopefully you can too. So the practice of slavery has a different face. It continues today in different ways and forms, but it's still very much with us. Sex slavery is one of the most prominent ones we have in the world today. And I, I was in Jamaica a couple of years ago when I saw this news report of a woman who was invited to a job interview. And when she showed up, someone picked her up and she was taken to this building. And when she went in, she, she, she had some suspicions, but she was desperate. She had two children, I think, and she was um, unemployed for a while. And when she went in to the building, she never left. She never left the building. It was after a year. And what did they have her in there doing? Having sex every day, day in, day out with clients. And this is a common practice. And Jamaica is being highlighted as one of those places that, that, that criminals are facilitating this sex slavery. And it's happening all across the world. I watched a documentary the other day when um, refugees 
crossing the Mediterranean, trying to seek refuge in parts of Europe. Once they reached there, because they didn't have status, some Europeans would take advantage of them. Some Europeans would even go into the bush and have sex with them. They are treated like they are not human. It has continued. And these things are happening as we speak. The practice of slavery has continued and it's illegal as we speak. The, the American anti-slavery group um, reported that over 40 million people are enslaved around the world today. Again, I'm making that correlation between slavery and racism because both of them, because, because racism is rooted in slavery, it's one group of people who see themselves superior to another person. So they treat them less than human, right? And I've seen also in another documentary that I've watched on Netflix, that there are some persons, even in the Philippines, families who sell their children. And it's not just the Philippines. It happens in parts of Africa. It happens in parts of um, subcontinental India. It's happening in right now, where because of poverty, parents would sell a child to get money to feed the rest of the family. It's sad, but it's happening. And sometimes when people move from their home country to a foreign country, that's where the racism and the, the treatment, the inferior treatment comes in. And there's a lot more to that as well. And you can share your own experience. I'm sure many of us who left our home countries and came to Canada or the United States or parts, parts of Europe, we have our own stories. I have my own story. And if time allows, I will share that with you. Now, this is a point before I go get back to the comments, I want to share this, that it really caused me to pause and think. You know, the British monarchy is, is, is admired. The queen died, but I, I don't think the monarchy will maintain the kind of admiration no, that it had with Queen Elizabeth II. She knew the legacy that she inherited and she made a deliberate effort to travel the world, to wave and smile. And the British are known for, no, no in today's world, they are known for decorum, manners, their, their lovely accents, um, tea, um, their, their proper dressing manners. That's what they're known for today. And they use that as a guise. They know what happened. They know their legacy and they don't want to be seen in that light. So they make every effort to paint, to, to whitewash all of it. And that is the reason the young man that was born in the palace, who is now um, rebelling, as it were, and writing books and doing interviews and stuff. Um, he's getting a lot of heat from the British press and from the firm because they, they can't afford to be seen in a certain light. Now, when you talk about slavery and racism, we often jump at the British. But, but I'm going I'm to get back to the British. But if you look at the new world, you will notice something. It's not just Britain. There is France, there's Quebec in Canada, there is Haiti, most notoriously, and other small, small islands in the Caribbean, parts of Africa, Sierra Leone, Guinea, Algeria, French-speaking African nations. So the French were also heavily involved. The Spanish, every single country, from Mexico down to the tip of South America, to Chile, all speak Spanish except Brazil, that was held by the Portuguese. So you have Spain, France, Portugal, and then a few little islands held by the Dutch or Netherlands. Yes, but England, Spain, France, and Portugal feature prominently in the Western Hemisphere. 
They are the ones who conquered, pillaged, and stole property. I'm getting deeper into it to kind of, you know, unravel the whole thing. Right? Hear this. I'm going to share this one point, then jump to the comments. Four years after the UK abolished slavery, four years, they abolished slavery in 1833, as I mentioned before. Four years after they abolished slavery, the parliament passed the Slave Compensation Act of 1837. It compensated, the British government compensated 3,000 slave-owning families with a total of about 20 million pounds. The equivalent, which is about 16.5 billion pounds today, this is according to the National African American Reparations Commission. This debt, this debt was only paid off in 2015. 2015. Remember I mentioned the slave ship Zong and how Captain Collingwood threw over 130 slaves overboard and then file an insurance claim. All the people with the surname Collingwood in England. No, I'm kidding. No, it can't be all of them. But, but remember the name. He filed an insurance claim. And when slavery was abolished by the British, yes, former slave owners filed their losses of their human cargo the human property that they owned, I'm using quotes, the human property that they owned, they filed insurance claims and the British parliament paid them back for the property, for the human beings they owned. The last payment according to the NAARC was made in 2015, as recently as 2015. No wonder, no wonder racism is ever present. No wonder we can't shake it. Because at heart, some of these same countries, the British still see Africans and other people as well as inferior. Slavery abolished, but families of former slave owners have been receiving payments from the British government. So we hear, we hear the word reparations a lot these days. Now, if I always say, if the British were interested in reparations, they would have written checks a long time ago. But they are not. A government who is paying off families of former slave owners is not interested in reparations. And I want to get deeper into reparations as well because we, 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 we ask these people to apologize and an apology is pretty easy. Good, an apology is easy. Uh, recently, I think it was the, the Prime Minister of the Netherlands who apologized and it was accepted, uh, kind of. But the British have not because they're not interested Deep down, they are still the same people. Why on earth would they be paying families of former slave owners monies for human property that they lost? We need to look into these things and recognize the kind of world we live in. And we have to make that deliberate effort not to allow history to repeat itself. I'm going to go to the comments. Good. Uh, let me see. Miguel is commenting again. Egypt, ancient Greece, and Rome all enslaved other races and viewed their captives as subhuman. Because they saw other people as subhuman, they figured... Let's, put, let, let's, let's enslave them. And if you read the, the Bible account, which is a historical account, a true account, you will see that 
the 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 the, the difference between what happened to enslaved Jews and Africans is Jews were first invited to live in Egypt. In a time of drought in the world, Egypt had stockpiled grain and they, they were okay. So other nations went to Egypt. And at the time, a guy called Joseph, he was governor in Egypt. And if you read the Bible account, you will get the details. But that king who had hired Joseph died. And the new king who took over saw that the Jews were growing in number. And he figured, listen, these people are too much in Egypt. We have to keep them under control. So let's enslave them. And a lot of times when um, people know, um, talk about black people, talk about slavery, we forget that our forefathers were guilty as well. Good? We're guilty as well. Africans enslaved Africans. Africans enslaved other persons. But we focus on 300 years, between the 1500s and the 1800s. We focus on that 400 years, right? But we need to remember that it's not just that simple. Tamara is saying, we learned that indigenous people of Jamaica were wiped out when in fact their history was erased. We do have indigenous people still in Jamaica today, contrary to our history books. Well, if they are present in Jamaica tomorrow, they are not very vocal. And I would love to hear from our indigenous people. As far as I know, there are none. History was indeed erased. And as far as we know, they were wiped out. But we don't see anyone in Jamaica looking the part. The only place I've seen a representation of Jamaica's indigenous people is on our coat of arms because they would have a similar physical look as other indigenous people in the Americas. But um, that's arguable. Um, yeah. So uh, Tamar is saying they were assimilated among the Maroons. But again, the Maroons, I watched a short documentary and they have artifacts not sure if they died out after their assimilation maybe they did okay um and tomorrow did share a link in the chat on facebook i can't check it right now but i will check at a later time um miguel again is commenting and saying africa was not invaded and conquered they willingly facilitated the slave trade because they were a divided continent and still are a divided continent. So Africa has yet to unite in purpose. The African leaders know are still at odds. Um, maybe they want, one person wants control and they're not getting it. And if you look at, I, I was watching one movie last night and even in the Congo, which is a big one, the Republic of the Congo, they were always going back and forth in Rwanda as well. Currently in Nigeria, you have the Boko Haram trying to take over the government. So African nations are still not able to find common ground. Probably the wealthiest continent in the world. Every mineral, everything is in Africa. Yet they are still dependent on the United States and Europe for some semblance of economic stability, which should not be, but because they can't unite in purpose, um, that's the reason. An apology is admitting the truth, Tamara is saying, but I would rather see reconciliation follow. Reparations, return of what which was taken, earned, that's what we would prefer. That's what we would prefer, Tamara. But if you look at what I just read, that the British were repaying the families of former slave owners, you would see where their interest is, right? The equivalent of what they have paid back is 16.5 billion pounds to families of former um, slave owners. Just imagine, you capture people, you take slaves, and you say, okay, we are done with slavery now, but we're going to pay you back 
for the human cargo you owned. That's justice. And then they expect us to be happy and so happy to stay in their so-called commonwealth of nations. They have no interest in returning anything. And we can continue to call for reparations. Recently, I read an article online. Um, I don't know if you know the actor, Benedict Cumberbatch. He, he famously is Doctor Strange in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. His family owned a plantation in Barbados, the Cumberbatch family. And um, his mother and his, he and his father actually had changed their names to Carlton at some point in time. But I think after his father died, he changed his name back to Cumberbatch. And his mother was telling him, look, don't use that name because they're going to come after you for money. That's what, that's what his, that, that was his mother's advice, according to the article. So you have many British families, and I'm going to point out one in Jamaica, many British families who profiteered from the slave trade, who people now revere the monarchy being at the head, right? And they are going around the world trying, making speeches and attempting to sugarcoat the rape, the murder, the fraud, the genocide, the annihilation, the ethnic cleansing that they are guilty of. When we talk about Nazi Germany, the British are happy because they get to hide. And notice, you don't hear the Spanish saying anything. They, they, they remain silent. They don't want anyone to remember what they did. The French, they remain silent. They don't want anybody to remember. Shh. The Dutch, they are the, they are the most silent. The Portuguese are silent as well. Don't say Portugal, just focus on the British. Just focus on Nazi Germany so we can keep hiding. But they're all guilty of the same thing. But while the British are prominent in slavery and racism, we have to call out the others as well because they're as culpable, they're as guilty as the British were. Um, so let me see, there is a comment here and let's read the last one. The implication of the Brits paying for the loss of the slave commodity does um, what's unabashedly lend credence, even in modern era, to the idea that some humans are lesser and greater than others. They are still in that mindset. If they were not in that mindset, they would not have paid back those monies to former slave owners. Instead, they would have paid that money to former enslaved nations, but they are proud of the colonies. They are proud of their commonwealth. They are proud of their empire. So with Barbados leaving, it's a hit to them. Jamaica should leave next, but I'm not sure if the Jamaican politicians have the will to do that just yet. Have we stopped to think, Tamara is saying, that the graduation, that the Gradations of color in Jamaica are a result of the atrocities of slavery, but of course. And if we should, let's pick out an example. Let's pick out Bob Marley. Bob Marley's mother was a slave. Bob Marley's father was a British person. And maybe he loved her, but he couldn't marry her because it wasn't allowed. And you, you can see that mix in the children. You, Jamaica is pretty much a mixed nation, hence our motto, out of many, one people. So yes, and, and, and this is how we come to classism in Jamaica as well. Yeah. Because after slavery, you had a mix of people in Jamaica, and then there was intermarriage, so you had the lighter-skinned Jamaicans mm -hmm. and the darker-skinned Jamaicans. Mm -hmm. And the lighter skinned Jamaicans felt themselves better off than the darker skinned Jamaicans. And it still exists today. But, but less of it is there. You know, you, education, and, I, and oh my, the, 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 there is a lot to say about how education changed the landscape. But I remember at Cornwall College, uh, there was an auditorium, and we used to go in there and have other um, stuff. And on the wall, I noticed one day 
all the headmasters or principals were white until a particular time. And let me just say this too. Those of us who live in former British colonies and those schools we boast about, traditional schools, those schools weren't built for the children of slaves. The British built those schools for themselves and their children. Good? Understand that. But we boast about the traditional schools because yeah. they, they were built a long time ago and they have a good reputation, right? Not remembering they weren't built for us. And this colorism and classism came out of slavery, colonialism into present day Jamaica. There is one family, prominent family in Jamaica, the Kerr Jarrets, they own thousands of acres of land in Jamaica. They are well known in Jamaica as nation builders. They have contributed to nation building. But I was happy to read about that history. The Kerrs and the Jarrets are two British families, good? And during the, the, the time of slavery in the 1800s, they came to Jamaica, they saw the place, decided to stay, and there was an agreement. And this type of agreement was something that was common in Europe, where marriage would be used to, 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 to join nations or to broker peace, right? So the two families agreed that they would get married. But a condition of the marriage would be to keep both family names. Hence the Kerr Jarrets today. Now, when you talk about reparations, we always talk about Britain paying us back. But I think true reparation starts at home, on the ground. The Kerr Jarrets, the Kerrs and the Jarrets stole land. Now, if, you, if I show up in Canada and I go on my computer and type a piece of paper, and sign it, and my wife signs it, and our friends sign it. Can we say we own the land? Can we just, but that's what the British did in Jamaica. They stole the land, created their own titles, and say, oh, it's ours. And today they are known as nation builders because from the land, from the wealth they stole, they built an empire, built businesses, built houses, and all the other things and sold it back to the children of the slaves. Stole from the slaves, built it up from the wealth from the slaves and the labor of the slaves, and then sell it back to the children of the slaves. And they are hailed as nation builders. That's where we are in Jamaica and other former British territories. That's where we are, right? So um, I'm coming down to the end of, of, of the show, it's five more minutes. Um, where are we? Um, Miguel, I am for reparations, but I am for total justice. The emphasis has always been on the Europeans paying, but what about the Africans? Don't they also owe the debt, right? Yeah. And Tamara is saying, so right, part of the elitism. It's all coming from that. And you're right, Miguel, you're right, because we often say Britain should pay. Spain should pay too. Portugal should pay too. France should pay too. The Dutch should pay. And the Africans should pay because they were involved. And we always have the discussion on slavery and racism as if Africans are victims. We weren't involved. We were so innocent. And I understand the context behind the transatlantic slave trade and what unfolded after that, especially in the United States, and what took place after the abolition of slavery. Only some states accepted it, and slaves had to run northwards for freedom. Some died searching for freedom. And e even till recent, recently, 70s and 80s, 90s, even coming up, lynching continued in the United States. So I understand the context, right? However, in the grand scale of things, are the British the only one, the only ones? There is a lot more to it. And a lot of people have become experts 
at hiding, at disguising. And we have to call everything out as it is, right? We talked about the experience growing up in Jamaica. And we, we really didn't, as I said, one hour will never be enough to discuss this subject, right? One year will never be enough to discuss this subject. But perhaps I'm going to have a part two to focus more on racism since the foundation is set and we mentioned it and we mentioned reparations. This is like a foundational conversation. But the part two of this will focus more on racism and how that is seen in a global context, in a Western context, in a North American context, and we, we can, you know, kind of flesh it out some more. But I wanted to go from this perspective to create that context so that the next conversation can build on that. And it was a lot, it was a lot to research. It was a lot to read. And the, the movies on Netflix, I invite you to go over there and watch it if you have a subscription to Netflix. Some good films are there that gives you some real insight into some of the things that happened in those years coming up. Thank you for joining. Thank you for chiming in, Miguel and Tamara. Thank you so much for your insight. And um, Miguel is saying one, two, three movies. You can go there and watch it too. If you have um, access to those streaming platforms, go there and watch some of these films that depict those true experiences um, that people went through, slavery and racism. It's good to know, but how we treat with it is the next question. We have come to the end of episode two of The Green Lane. Thank you for joining. Thank you for watching. I appreciate everybody who chimed in. Tash, who was here with me to um, share the uh, um, Facebook feeds and comments. Miguel, Tamara, and everyone else. Share with your friends. I want this to grow. And this um, live discussion will be reposted on Facebook and LinkedIn. And I will also be creating the Green Lean channel on YouTube. You can go back over YouTube. You can go to YouTube and you can watch them there as well. Thank you so much. Take care of yourselves. Be safe. And I hope you'll have a fantastic week.